Leviticus chapter 19. We'll be there for a little bit tonight. Survey of the Bible. Glenda's going to come sing for us, and then we'll get into the Bible study. Leviticus 19. Good. Thank you, Glenda. Chapter 19, book of Leviticus, and uh, we're going to look at a survey tonight quickly of this book, give you really the theme of the book this evening, and uh, it's very plain, very simple, very clear, and very relevant for us today. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll bless the service as we get into your word now. Thank you for the good prayer time. It's good to just kneel and pray and bring all the names of these people, Lord, that were added to the list tonight are going to have surgery or have had surgery or, or just having difficulty in a certain area physically. Pray for this young lady with this baby and pray that you'll be with them. Lord, thank you for the good report about the cars uh, getting to India and things going well and already uh, got the baby and underway. So Lord, that's a blessing. I pray that you'll just give them a safe return trip home and, and uh, take care of their children while they're gone. Bless me. Help me in these uh, moments. Give me grace, wisdom, power as I bring the Bible lesson. Help us to know about the greatest book ever written, your book. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Third book of our Bible called Leviticus. The, the, the Leviticus means the Lord called. The Lord called. Now, it's a calling for something specific. It's not just a generic calling. There's a specific calling in this book. The name is given, Leviticus, the Lord called, because the book deals primarily with the Levitical priesthood and their service in the work of the tabernacle. You'll remember the 12 tribes of Jacob and the one tribe was the tribe of Levi. That's the Levitical tribe chosen or called by God to be the priestly tribe. The priests were the men who were the mediators between God and the people. Are you hearing me okay tonight? 
Because I don't know if something's wrong. With the, I didn't hardly hear this. The, the, the monitors might not be working, but you're, you're hearing me okay? No? Yes, okay. All right, very good. Uh, uh, the, the priests were the men who were the mediators between God and the people. They were go-betweens. That's what the word mediator means. This was going on Sunday, wasn't it? In and out? Is it doing that again? No. Yes. Yeah, I think so too. All right, so this has got to go. All right. Very good. The mediators were between, uh, between God and the people. They were go-betweens for God and the people. So the Levitical priests were called out to stand before the people of God. Uh, before, they were called out to stand before the people in place of God and before God uh, for the people. The key word in the book is the word holy. It's used 94 times. Now, folks, that's no accident. 94 times. Now, you remember what the word Leviticus means. It means called out. The Lord called, okay? And it's a specific calling, and the word holy is used 94 times. In 27 chapters, that means, that's, that means it's used a lot of times in every chapter, okay? The Levitical priests were the men that God called out to live a life of holiness themselves and to also teach the way of holiness to the people. So they were called to a specific life of holiness, and then they got to teach that life to the people. Basically, Leviticus is a book about separation. That's what it's a book about. And that's what the Lord called these men to, these Levites. He called them to a life of separation, a life of holiness. And then they were supposed to live that life themselves. And it wasn't supposed to stop with them. They were supposed to teach that life to the children of Israel. A call, a Lord, the Lord called to a life of holiness, a life of separation. The laws that were given in this book uh, were civil in nature. They were ceremonial in nature. They dealt with moral laws. There were laws about re religious laws. There were sanitary laws. There were a lot of laws given in this chapter. They teach the acceptable way of approach for the people to a holy God and then how they can walk holy, uh, becoming as his, what would be becoming to his people, a life of holiness that would be becoming to his people. Now, we need to remember that in this New Testament day, we have no priestly tribe of called out men who are mediators to stand between God and us. We have no priestly tribe of men between us. There is one mediator. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the go-between. And every saved person is called to be a priest. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that God hath made us kings and priests. So all saved people have been accepted in the beloved, that's Jesus Christ. We all have access to God through Jesus, and we have been called to a life of holiness that is becoming to the people of God. A life of separation, a life of holiness. Okay, that's what this book is all about in the book of Leviticus. Now, in chapter 19 and verse 2, you find the key verse in the entire book. God says, speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is what he called them to. A life of holiness. Every believer in this, in this church, every saved person has also been called to a life of holiness. It's part of God's calling. Once we get saved. Now, we have several lessons. I got three lessons from this verse on the subject of holiness or separation. And I, I won't, of course, I hope everybody will listen. But I, I especially want the young people to listen carefully to all of these lessons. These lessons are important for all of us. Now, I'm going to tell you what, what it, this, is, this, this next little part is my opinion, okay? But it's not just based on what I, what I see and feel. It's based on... What I, in talking to some other men in the ministry, pastors and even evangelists, men who travel from church to church, it seems that the young people of our churches today have a difficult time with the matter of separation. They have a hard time with it. They have a hard time accepting it. They have a hard time incorporating it into their life, even though in many cases they've been taught that all the way from uh, childhood all the way through. They've been taught the biblical principles about separation, about why this and why that. But, but 
and I'm not saying all of them, but I'm saying there is, there is a good number. And I don't mean just in Faith Baptist Church. I mean in independent Baptist churches like this one. I mean, you know, we, I, you know I talk about things that go on here. And folks, and it, it, sometimes in other churches, maybe churches don't have as big a problem as we have in some areas. And in some other churches, they have, a, they have problems that are magnified tenfold. And I'm not looking around comparing and measuring. I'm just saying my opinion based on what I see as a whole right now, I think our young people are having a difficult time with the matter of separation. They have not accepted the principles of holiness concerning dress, concerning entertainment, concerning behavior, concerning worship. They've not accepted it. I got saved, I was saved in the, in the midst of the 70s when there was a lot of preaching and emphasis on separation and I accepted it. I was taught from the Bible and I thought, man, if that's what the Bible says, then who cares what my opinion is? And so I accepted it. But we, we, we have, we, the, young people, the young people today have been reared, even in our Christian schools, and I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about one or two people here. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a, a bunch, okay? They, even in the Christian school and even in, even in godly homes, our young people have been raised in a culture saturated with relativism and tolerance. Saturated with relativism and tolerance. I, I, and I don't care... It, it, and I think, the, I think the greatest medium for that is the television. And then you got peers. But it's satur- the, the, the culture is saturated with relativism and tolerance. Now, in the minds of many of our young people, and, and I can talk a little bit knowledgeably about this because I've spoken with many of them and with some of the other preachers who are facing the same thing. In many of the minds of our young people, there is no right and wrong. There's no line of demarcation. And I don't mean just about, I mean, I don't mean just about dress and entertainment, I mean about marriage. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it's amazing to me. Everything is relative. Everything is relative to who you are and what situation you are in as a person. You know, and if your idea of right and wrong is different from mine, well, that's cool. You know, I may not, you know, I may never be a homosexual, but if that's your choice, that's cool. Christian kids. Christian kids. I'm not talking about public school kids getting reached by the buses. I'm talking about, I'm talking about homeschool and church school kids. You know, what's right for you is cool, and what's right for me is cool. It's relativism. It's tolerance. It's dangerous. It's, uh, it's, it's, somebody says, how? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know all the answers. I just know in the book of Proverbs, the Bible talks about there is, a, there is a generation who's very lofty. Their eyelids are very lofty. They're very proud. Very proud. To me, the height of pride is to look something so plain as day as homosexuality in the Bible and say, you know what? Yes, it's not right for me, but if it's, if it's what you choose, then that's okay for you. That's cool. That's pride. It's the height of pride. Uh, it's dangerous. It's, it, it seems, my opinion, it seems to open the door to other problems more serious in nature. When you don't have specific boundaries, when you don't have specific parameters so that when you cross a line, you cross from right to wrong, then folks, you're, that, that, that's dangerous. You don't know where the line is. Yeah, you know, we have a we have an elementary school classroom that is that that's very uh, it's it's got some aggressive kids in it. And I love aggressiveness. I think it's great. And and the teacher has done such a good job in that class. And the boys and girls, for the most part, they know where the lines are, and they're having a great school year. That's the kind of atmosphere that lines of demarcation create 
the Creator. Uh, there's, a, there's a freedom, you know, as long as I stay within these lines, man, it's great. And I know where the line is. But when the line is always moving, I, I don't know. I don't know what's right, what's wrong. I don't, you know, and what, you may be, what may be right for you may be wrong for me. And what may be wrong for me may be right for you. And, and you're cool. And I hope you're listening to me tonight. That's a very dangerous thing. And, and, and you know, and I don't think that the only thing in the Christian life is, is matters of separation when it comes to dress and entertainment and, and behavior and so forth. But I do think it's important. I think there's enough in the Bible that makes it important to us. Yeah, I, I had a... Just three or four years ago, a woman, you know, uh, she was involved, had some responsibility, and, and, and she decided that she was, she was going to wear pants, and some women decide that, and, you know, we, don't, we, we have people in our church that wear pants. You can be a church member here if you wear pants as a woman. It's nothing to do with membership, but there are certain opportunities and responsibilities that we don't give to people, to ladies, unless they've adopted the Bible teaching that we believe the Bible teaches about pants on women, Okay. Now, now, so she decided, you know, I'm not going to do that. So she was in the office and, you know, she was trying to justify her decision by pointing out that I, I may do this, but so-and-so gossips and I may do this, but so-and-so criticizes and I do this. I may do this, but so-and-so is guilty of tailbearing and I, I can't stand when, when people, let's just deal with the problem right here, okay? You don't justify based on what everybody else is doing. And, and and the justification was, you know, man. I mean, they they do they get to have their responsibilities, but they're a gossip, you know. And I, well, you know what? I, I'm not for gossiping, and I'm not for for criticism. I'm not for talebearing. I'm not for. I don't think the Bible's for that. <laughs> but but the ladies who were charged with those sins did not end up working in a sports bar. Like the lady who, who, who threw away the line of separation did. So the gossip never works in a sports bar. What are you saying? Is go, so you, gossip's okay? No, gossip's, gossip's is, is, is forbidden in the word of God. God talks about that being part of the old nature. Get a grip on it. Get a grip on your tongue. But I, I, here I got a woman that's within the boundaries of, of personal separation She's a gossip. She needs to get that fixed. I got another woman going outside the boundaries of personal separation, and she's trying to justify it because this one's a gossip, but wears a dress, but at least she doesn't end up working in the sports bar. That's a, that's, that's a tad bit tough, huh? Putting, putting alcohol to, to the lips. And, I'm, and, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I do think, folks, that some folks have, have been exposed to more Bible teaching and principles than others have. And by the grace of God, I, we want to keep a church that always has people in all stages of Christian growth. And everybody's welcome. I'm just making the point. It's a dangerous thing. And I got no bitterness in my heart. I'm not mad. I, I, I have no... Vit you know, I, I ran into... I stopped to get a coffee here. It's Shell coming in tonight, this afternoon. I come in, I've enjoyed coming in early on Wednesday, later on Wednesday afternoons. I go home at noon usually and come back 5, 4.35. No place is quiet. And, and uh, so uh, I stopped to get a coffee. And Dr. Octantillo, he was getting a coffee. They left us. And he, he left right. I said, Tunji, good to see. We've fellowshiped for a while there. You know, I, that's nuts. Man, he, shoot, he gave me his card and cell phone number, house phone number, a doctor's number, said call me any time, day or night, if your son or daughter-in-law ever have a problem over in Madagascar. I mean, he gave me that a long time ago. They, they, they landed at a church up North Tenley Park, a contemporary church. That's, that's what they, if that's what they wanted, that's what they wanted. That's fine. He was getting a coffee. I went up and paid for mine. I bought his. I said, I'll pay for his too. We had a good time. I, I, I got no vendetta against folks that leave. I'm not a, I got a vendetta against that woman. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you know, to me, if you, if you don't have some boundaries and some parameters in your life concerning 
What the Bible teaches about dress and behavior and, and entertainment and worship, it's a dangerous thing. And we got a group of young people, not just us, it seems like in every church right now, that they, they, will, they refuse to embrace separation. They refuse to embrace it. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. That makes me sad. That's what it makes me. It makes me very sad. So there's something about the, the principles of separation that are very safe. Very safe. And young people, you need, to, you need to understand that God may not have called you to preach or to marry an evangelist or be a missionary, but God has called you. If you're saved, you are called to a life of holiness. And that's in every area of my life. And that's what Leviticus is all about. So well, this is the Old Testament doesn't apply to us. <laughs> Very definitely applies to us. We are made priests. This book was written to the priests. The priests were called to a life of holiness. Live it themselves and teach it to the people. Now God didn't change all that when the New Testament came along. Okay. Now, let's look here, uh, two or three things about this matter of holiness and this matter of separation. Look at chapter 19. Look at, look, look at our text verse, which is verse number two. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Number one, the nature of God is holiness. The nature of God. I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, listen very carefully. I, I touched on this some, some months ago, but let me retouch on it again. God's holiness is intrinsic. Okay? It's a big word. Young people don't have to worry about what that word means. I'm going to tell you, it's very simple, really. That, this means God's holiness is real. It's genuine. It's true. It's internal. It's inherent. God is holy. That's what he is. You and I are not holy. God is holy. And if we live a holy life, it's only made possible because we get saved and we, are, we live under the control of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Okay? Now, you got Isaiah chapter 6. Don't turn to it. You got Isaiah chapter 6. You got these six winged creatures, the seraphim, flying around the throne of God. Isaiah sees them in the year that King Uzziah dies. And they're flying around that throne and they are saying, Holy, holy, holy. That's what Isaiah saw. Now you get to Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 8 and you got six winged creatures. Same one, seraphim. And they're flying around the throne of God and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. Now look people, there's 850 years between the writings of Isaiah and the writings of John on the Isle of Patmos. 850 years these creatures, I, I hate to use this, uh, uh, what would this be? These, I don't mean to be irreverent, but these creatures, these seraphim, have been hanging around God, if you will, for 850 years that we know of. Actually, they've been hanging around God for eons and eons. John on the Isle of Patmos, when he saw those six-winged creatures, he said, they rest not day and night. They never sleep. So they never take a break. They never call a time out. So endlessly, for at least we know 850 years, and we know beyond that, eons and eons of time as we know it, these seraphim have been hanging around God, and they continue to say the same thing all the time. Holy, holy, holy. It would take you 24 hours of hanging around me to say, carnal, carnal, carnal. 
And I don't want to bust your bubble, but it probably wouldn't take me 24 hours of hanging around you. Am I right? We're all that way, are we not, huh? I mean, we, we might, you know, we might fool somebody for six or eight hours and they got to go take a nap, you know? And we live like the devil while they're gone, you know? But these creatures never rest day or night. They never take a break. They've been flying around the throne room of God, around his throne for eons and 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 eons. They keep saying the same thing over and over again. Holy, 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 holy. God is holy. That is his nature, intrinsic nature, real, genuine, true, internal. That's what our God is. Now, the Bible also teaches us something else. The Bible also teaches us that out of the abundance of the heart, the what speaks? The mouth speaks. No other book in our Bible, 66 books in our Bible, no other book in our Bible, out of the other 65, no other book contains more words that come directly from the mouth of God than Leviticus does. You say, I thought all our Bible came from the mouth of God. It does, but sometimes the words of God came through Peter. Sometimes the words of God came through Paul, through, through Elijah. Sometimes the words of God were words about history. Look at verse number one. Look at it there. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. So God spoke directly to Moses. Watch this. 56 times in 27 chapters, it is stated that God spoke the words to Moses. God is the direct speaker throughout most of the book. Now, if the mouth speaks from the abundance of the heart, what does God's mouth speak about in the book of Leviticus? Holiness. And the reason his mouth speaks about holiness is because that's what God is. Are you with me tonight, church? He is holy. Nobody talks, walks, breathes, eats, sleeps, cubs baseball like Ernie Banks. Maybe Sharon Thomason's a close second, but Ernie, Ernie Banks. Okay. Ernie Banks. I mean, the guy, you know, hey, hey, it's a happy day. Let's play whatever he says. You know, just play two. It's, it's, he just, he, he. in fact, what, what do they call him? They call him what? Mr. Cub. You got a statue out there and everything. It, it's in his heart, so it comes out of his mouth. It's in his heart. Uh, you know, I, I love to listen to the broadcast, and I guess a close second to him would be Ron Santo on the broadcast. Man, that, that guy, he doesn't just analyze the play. He emotionalizes the play. <laughs> oh, ah, oh, yes. And I'm just, you know, it's, just, it's great just to listen to the radio broadcast and listen to him. It's, it's in them, so it's what comes out of their mouth. And God speaks directly. I mean, the, Leviticus contains... More verses that God said to Moses, write down, write this down, speak this to the people, write this down. There are more references to God speaking directly in Leviticus than there is any other book. And Leviticus is the book about holiness. I'm just trying to say tonight, the nature of God is holiness. He said, I, the Lord, your God, am holy. That's his nature. Amen. Now, number two. God has called us to be like him. God has called us to be like him. So God has called us to a life of holiness. Look what he said in verse number two. Ye shall be holy. I don't believe that's an option. I don't believe he said pray about this, Christian. Ye shall be holy. Look, we are the people of God. Do you know people of the desert take on certain characteristics that are specific to the desert? People of the jungle take on certain characteristics that are specific to the jungle. Ben and Ashley, you know, they, they, he, ben was talking, people on islands, 
that, that were born and reared and never leave the island, they take on certain characteristics that are specific to the island. They're having a time. Ashley killed a two-inch cockroach the other day. <laughs> two inches. Two inches. Now, we've had a couple, three mouse mice get in the house, and I'm living with all females now. And it's bedlam. It's bedlam when a mouse is in the house. Bedlam. I hunted Monday with Brother Woodward over there, and I called after the morning hunt to see how Joyce was doing, and uh, we have a mouse. And he's in the closet. And I put the, 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 what do you call that thing? Sheet, the rug there, so he couldn't get out the, the door. And she'd go by every now and again, knock on the door. I know you're in there. <laughs> and every time we talked, she was talking about the mouse, the mouse, the mouse. I said, we'll catch the mouse. They, they, they don't bother me. They're little cute little things running around. The old beady eyes. But oh, I mean, we're on chairs with brooms and I mean, screaming at the top of our lungs. Mouse. I set a trap, I opened the door, I slid it in, I closed the door. 10 minutes, snap. Dead mouse. How'd you like to have two inch cockroaches running around? Huh? Now that to me is sick. Two inch cockroaches. And in talking to him, it's very, it's very clear that people who live on the island, they're island people, they, they, there's certain characteristics that are specific to the island. Greeks take on characteristics that are specific to Greece. Germans take on characteristics that are specific to Germany. Italians take on characteristics that are specific to Italy. We become the people of our homeland. We become the people of our people. Go overseas and it won't take the, the people that long to identify you as an American. Because we are people of America. But Christian friend, we are more than just the people of America. We are the people of God. Stop and let that sink in. We are the people of God. God is holy. And if we take on the characteristics of God, then we will take on holiness. It only stands to reason if we are the people of the Holy One, then we will take on holiness. Now, God brought Israel out of Egypt we talked about that last week in the book of Exodus. He immediately gave them a place to worship him called the tabernacle. Then God gave Israel instructions on the kind of sacrifices they were to make in worshiping him. Now don't miss this. There was a right way to worship and there was a wrong way to worship. And, and this is again, this is, this is again where we are with this younger generation. Hey, you know, if, if that's what, if that's how you want to, if that's where you like to go to church, that's cool. Ah, tired of hearing that word cool. It means not so hot. Oh, I just want to. Ah, ah. No, there are right ways to worship and there are wrong ways to worship. And God laid all that out. And then he gave Israel instructions on how they were to walk or to live before him. By the way, right worship usually results in a right walk. Yeah. Fleshly, sensual worship usually results in a fleshly, sensual walk. And right worship usually results in a right walk. Now listen, folks. It took one chapter for God to bring Israel out of Egypt. Huh? Exodus chapter 12. It took 27 chapters for God to get Egypt out of Israel. 27. 
It took a whole book. Now look, you and I get saved by repenting and turning to Jesus Christ, trusting in him, and, and by faith receiving him as our personal savior. Boom, bang. That happens instantaneously. When you trust Christ, you're saved. Then they're signed, sealed, it's done. And praise God, it's done forever. But the world's still in us. And it takes time, it takes time, it takes time to get the world out of us. But listen, if I am a child of God, I am going to take on characteristics that are specific to God. Amen. And he is holy. Charles Spurgeon said, I believe the holier a man becomes, the more he mourns over the unholiness that remains in him. Boy, that's, tough. that's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. So we're called to a life of holiness. A young person, you know, maybe some of you are so young that you're not even thinking about this now. Maybe some of you reaching the latter years of high school, you're starting to think about this. Maybe some of you are out of high school, maybe this is where you are tonight. You know, just, you're just really, you, 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 don't, you, you don't want to embrace the principles of separation. I'm telling you. That God has called us to a life of holiness. Called us to that. And it's not just a one issue thing. Not just one issue. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's several issues. Several things involved. Now, number three, let me say this tonight. God has the right to call us to holiness. He has the right to call us to holiness. Chapter 20, next chapter over, verse number seven. He has the right to call us to holiness. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number 7. Look with me here. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God. Now, do you want to see what God said here? God said, be holy. I am the Lord your God. In other words, God said, look, I am the Lord your God and because I am, I have the right to command you to live by this standard of holiness. I'm your God. It's my right. It's my, it's my prerogative. Now you follow this progression with me. thought about this last week after I got done with the book of Exodus, started thinking about Leviticus. Follow this progression with me. Genesis. You got the creation of man and his fall into sin. Exodus, the redemption of fallen man. Redemption. Then you come to Leviticus. Right after man was redeemed, God called him to a life of holiness or separation. So you got the creation of man, his fall into sin. You got that man's redemption in the book of Exodus. And the very next book, God spends the whole book, the whole book, talking about how he wants and expects that redeemed man to live holy. Bang, bang, bang. God created us, owned us by right of creation. We sinned against our creator, fell into the same punishment for sin as the one who originally sinned, Lucifer. The, the, hell was created for him and his angels. So here we are, we're in a mess. God redeemed us, bought us back from our sinful condition through the death of the innocent lamb of God who shed his blood for us. Now we belong to God again. We belong to him. We left him and he bought us back a second time. Aren't you glad he did? Mercy, mercy, mercy. I keep thinking to myself over and over again that God could have just said, you know what, Adam and Eve, you, you just multiply and replenish the earth, but I've had it with you folks and your whole race is just doomed. I'm going to create a whole new man and woman over here and start over with them. Where would that leave you and me, descendants of Adam and Eve? So he bought us back through the death of his innocent lamb, Jesus, who shed his blood. Now we belong to God again. This time, not by right of creation, by right of redemption, by the purchase of his own blood. And he says to those of us whom he has purchased, you live a life of holiness and separation unto me. And folks, it really does not matter if we agree with the standards of holiness or separation or not. It's not our prerogative. It's his. You see that? He owns us. 
and is well within his rights to demand of us a holy walk. Holiness is not a choice. It is a command. It is not an option. It's a calling. A calling. Young people and, I, and, 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 and adults even, if you have not embraced this matter of, of the principles of separation, to me it's very dangerous. Hey, I mentioned on Sunday in the message Sunday morning about uh, a, a, a person that came to a point. You remember Brother Caleb? It was Brother Caleb and I were talking about it. This, the person came to a point where to move ahead in the will of God, they had to make a choice. And I said, Brother Caleb, this is the choice they need to make if they want that responsibility. And Brother Caleb explained it to the person. And the person maybe didn't understand it, but the person said, you know what? That's fine. I can handle that. Not a problem. And I said on Sunday, we, we, we sat the other day, we marveled at the touch of God on that person's life. And there's somebody you probably never would guess. I mean, on the family and on their their service and just their just their their spiritual growth. You can just see it. The countenance. And the issue was a matter of separation. The issue was a matter of separation. Am I going to go forward in the will of God in this matter or not? And the and the person after Brother Caleb explained it, the person said, Okay, not a problem. On the other hand, I have seen other people come to the to other places in their life where the, it's time to move ahead in the will of God and they come to a matter of separation and they say, uh-uh. And it seems like they never get over the hump. They never get over the hump. It's just, it's just, it's just uh, uh. oh, I come to church and, you know, read the Bible and, and I'm telling you, the touch of God. And I, I'm saying to all of and I, everybody, this is for the oldest and the youngest, this whole lesson, but I, I especially think that you young people need to listen carefully tonight. I don't think it's your prerogative as a child of God to reach the age 20 and say, you know what? What's good for me may not be good for you. What's good for you may not be good for me. We're cool. And this, this mobile, flexible, ever-moving, always changing and fluctuating line of demarcation between right and wrong, to me, that's, that is most, one of the most dangerous ways in the world to live. You set the lines... And then let God set the lines, get inside of them, you'd know where they are, and have the time of your life. <laughs> I was talking uh, yeah, hey. I was talking to a young man, and uh, he was talking about him and his wife sitting around the table and just rejoicing and how God had allowed them to be reared and raised in Christian homes. And he said, Pastor, he said, we just, he, said, he wasn't bragging. He said, Pastor, we just, we don't have the baggage. We just don't have the baggage. He said, we're having the time of our life. I said, oh, no, it's hard. It's hard. The Christian life is hard. It's just hard. It's just, oh, it's just too narrow and confining, and you can't do anything. It's restricting, and it's just too hard. He laughed. No, it's not hard. You get inside the parameters of God's will, and you stay there, and I'll promise you, you'll have the time of your life. But if you're if you're going to let if you're going to just all time fluctuate relative intolerance and we're cool we're cool it's cool you're cool I'm afraid you're headed into some dangerous territory that could be it could be a devastating to you so please be careful about that we're called to a life of holiness and not just the pastor everybody and the pastor. And the preacher, yeah, yeah. And the preacher's kids, yep. We're called to a life of holiness.
That's what Leviticus is all about. Okay, let's pray. Lord, please bless us, give us grace, help us to be your people in every sense of the word. And Lord, to reach out and embrace the principles of separation that are taught in your book about our dress, our entertainment, uh, where we go, what we do, what we say, our behavior, our worship. And Lord, I pray for any right now in that, in that, in that fluctuating mode of, of whatever goes on is cool. I pray, God, that you'll snap them to some, uh, Lord, some real reality about right and wrong. And uh, God bless us to be people that are, that are, have characteristics of you, in particular, your holiness. Never carry ourselves with a better than thou attitude. But Lord, just live holy and clean, separate before you. In Jesus' name, let's stand, please. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let us play us a, a song of invitation to the heaven.